Hello, welcome to the Elite Performance Team Podcast. Dominic Perlo and Dr. Jan Kasperitz produce podcasts weekly with information in health, wellness, as well as guests. If this is your first time listening, thanks for listening. If you like our content, you can find more information on Facebook or subscribe to us on YouTube and iTunes. Today we have Roger Ashpong, creator of FinCraft Cycling Team. How are you, Roger? I'm very good. Good. Yeah, thanks for having me on the podcast. Absolutely. Start with the quote of the day by John F. Kennedy. Nothing compares to the simple pleasure of riding a bike. I thought this was very, very appropriate, especially for having you here, um, who's such an avid cyclist. Would you like to say anything about that quote? Yeah, I think that's a very good way of saying it, because um, that's really what it takes to ride a bike. You have to have the passion for it and like riding it. Absolutely. Doc, you? Yeah, um, it's just not basically hits the nail on the head with me because I used to ride a bike, gave my first independence as a kid. I used to have this uh, brown Huffy Wrangler. It had a banana seat on it, it had really, looked really weird. And then my dad tried to make it into like a BMX bike with like yellow tires that just looked really bad with yellow and beige. And uh, then he took a banana seat off, put his yellow seat on. I rode it for a couple of years, but then I remember one day uh, I came back from Polish school because I'm a, par- a child of immigrant parents and I had to go to Polish school every Saturday. And my mom was like, oh, we're gonna go to the bike store. I'm like, what? So we went and we picked up a Hutch BMX with uh, wind style, which is a fantastic looking bike, which over like the last probably six, seven years, I've, uh, I have a nice compilation of 80s BMX bikes, none of which I could buy because I'm 6'4", and these bikes are not made for people 6'4". But that's what regained my passion in cycling, the fact that it brings me back to when I was a kid. I think we're all kind of chasing that, being a kid, you know, trying to get away from certain responsibilities and be a kid at heart. So I, I, I love that. I think it's awesome. Doc, when you were a kid and rode BMX, were you more of a trick kind of guy, or uh, did you like more of the racing? I, I rode the nice bike for the girls. Gotcha. You know? Yeah. So. Uh, I couldn't do tricks. The, tr- the actual, the, the wind style was a heavy bike, but it was meant for freestyling. I have a really good friend, Kevin Spear, who just recently, he wanted to do like some father-son projects. So he, uh, he picked up a frame from Mongoose, an older one. He used to have a, um, uh, I forgot the uh, bike he had, but I, I called him up and he told me he's doing this with his kid. His kid, Tyler, fantastic kid. And, uh, I was like, why don't you come over, I'll give you two full mongooses, all the parts, you could use any parts you want on them, just give me back the frame. So it's cool seeing how people our age and our, in our 40s are basically trying to rekindle our, our youth, because even Roger, Roger's got his daughter cycling and she's kicking ass. So it, it's an awesome thing, I love the group. I, I, I very much like you, my first piece of freedom was a bicycle, and uh, I grew up in, in Karlstadt, and we were probably 14 years old, and we were riding to the Garden State Plaza in like jeans and a halfway decent shirt. If my mom sees this, she's probably going to yell at me, but anyway, and we would try to pick girls up. That's how we got to the mall, and we, we rode, you know, and it was a one gear right BMX, and, but I, I had, a, it's funny, I have a similar story, so I had a baby blue uh, I don't even know the kind of bicycle it was, but it had a banana seat and a little handle in the back. And anyway, it started raining. And my back door, he just pushed it and it opened up. So it was locked. So I ran to go out and I pushed on it, it was glass, and I went right through it. And I had to get stitches in my, in my wrist and, and up in my shoulder. Um, and then I, after that, years later, I went, you know, and BMX and stuff. But uh, then in my later read, then, you know, road, road cycling, and it's definitely a piece of freedom. How about you, Roger? When did you first start riding a bike? Uh, my story is quite different from you guys. <laughs> I grew up in Finland, so there, cycling is the first thing is just transportation. Sure. So I never took a school bus to school. I had to ride to school or ski to school or walk, but that wasn't fun. So the bike was the number one, and my parents didn't drive me to any other events either. Like soccer training or track and field or any kind of, that was local. So the bike was really the only way to get around. And it was just a natural thing. Everybody rode bikes and they still do. If you watch the internet and you see the school parking lots, have millions of bikes um, in almost most European countries. So so really that wasn't really about racing and we didn't have BMX bikes. 
that wasn't a thing in, in uh, Finland. Um, so we basically got a road bike as soon as we could get fit on it. And obviously they were too big most of the time in the right. beginning. And quite honestly, I didn't race much bicycles till I was maybe 14, 15. Um, because cross country skiing was my primary primary sport. How old were you when you started cross country skiing? I think I raced when I first was three, but obviously that wasn't <laughs> that serious. But uh, I would say eight, nine was the first. It was two year age groups, so eight, and then 10, 12, 14, 16. Would you say that due to the fact that you started at such a such young age with cross country skiing that built that engine that you had? I think that was part of it. Uh, I mean, you still have to have genetic. Sure. Um, but uh, the community I grew up in was a super competitive place, and very few people lived there. And you had to be on every team and every sport that was part of anything. Like there was a club sports, which was more competitive, and then the school sports. But you had to be on every team. And quite honestly, it wasn't always about having fun. It was who was the best and who won the most. And it was a very, no matter what you did, if you played soccer, you wanted to be the best guy in the field. Um, if you did volleyball, you, it was still a matter of who was the star on the team. Did you say volleyball? Well, yeah. What's that? <laughs> volleyball. <laughs> I, I pronounced my V. So volleyball. volleyball. <laughs> Roger, I, I apologize. I was like, I still have an accent. <laughs> I didn't know if it was like a sport that we don't have here. <laughs> like in America. Actually, and, you know, and you're, you're, a child, you're a child of the Mickey family as well. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's one of the letters that there was no difference in Swedish, uh, which is my first language. So we all know that you're, you're, you, you rock the bike here when you're riding. When you were younger, were there any other sports, team sports that you excelled in? Well, cross country skiing was the main thing. That was probably the national sport in Finland, so everybody wanted to be good at that. And I think I had the talent for that um, as well. And then in the summer, track and field is pretty big in Finland. Um, I wish I would have maybe focused more on one sport rather than too many when I was a kid. Uh, but at the other end, I also learned a lot from every sport and the motor skills and everything. So now when I do something, everything is, comes pretty easy to me. So I think that's something that kids in general should probably do more of when they're younger try different things and and uh, yeah that's a huge thing that's come down now a lot of the research is showing that you shouldn't be specializing in one specific sport uh, I see it all the time here a lot of kids seeing you know, their parents are having to play football right now football season's coming to an end but then it's like from January all the way through the beginning of August it's all football training football training football training and they're like oh but we're doing speed we're doing all this but the thing is you're just focusing on one thing I mean, when I was younger, you played, uh, I didn't play football as a kid, I played soccer, I played basketball, and then I played baseball. So then basically, I'm constantly changing different things. I was, I was decent in all of them, pretty good in, in basketball, then I eventually played football, I was pretty good too. But uh, the thing is, you're open to so many different things, and it, just the, the, the capacity that your brain to adapt to, the, to these things is, I think, makes you a better overall athlete, and also prevents a lot of injuries. Absolutely. So with um, specializing in one sport, like you can neglect a lot of things that you might not get from if you did some other sports. And then when you eventually have to choose one, if you are at the level that you could say you're gonna go to college and play a sport or, or become a professional athlete, then you have so much more, not like experience, but you, you're not, really singled out in one thing. Like you you sure. can run, you can you have eye hand coordination, you have balance stability, um, you have you might be able to sprint, you have the endurance. So like for cross country skiing, for example, it was a very good training. Like you used to ride bikes, you used to run, you run with poles, you used to roller ski in the summer, you do some strength training, not so much when you were young, but a little bit and then the actual skiing in, on the snow, you use every single muscle in your body. 
that's the highest VO2 um, any sport has. I, I, I read the most fit athletes in the world, highest VO2 lowest resting heart rate, cross country skiers. That's correct. I mean, there's some incredible numbers record, like 96% is the highest, I think. Um, obviously, you don't know if that's natural or right, of course, or aided with some, but um, uh, just uh, across the board, most skiers have a very high VO2 and um, low resting heart rates. And right. right. It's 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 pretty crazy. You wouldn't think it with the you, know, you look at runners, cycling, MMA, right? You would think that it wouldn't be that, uh, but definitely not, <laughs> not an easy sport. But cross country skiing is also a very technical sport, so that's something that if you master that when you're skater or junior, uh, that helps you with other things right later on. Um, it's kind of like swimming, like you have to learn how to swim when you're young. Uh, cross country skiing is similar. And now it's two different styles, it's skate skiing and then classic, and those are quite different from each other. Um, if and you got to learn how to become efficient at it, because it's not like you're just you know cross country skiing for a mile or two, so you're on a pretty good distance. Yeah, there's different distances. Uh, when I was junior, maybe 5Ks, 8Ks, and 10Ks for the, the normal distances, but nowadays, I mean, it's still 5 and 10 and 15 and the women 30 and men 50. Uh, it has changed a lot since I ski. Um, it's more mass starts and it's more spectator um, friendly sports like sure. multiple laps and, and smaller stadiums and arenas. So, uh, Which is also true with cycling, like mountain biking and cyclocross. And did you ever delve into actual competitive running? Yes, I know. I, I ran quite a bit actually. And, there was a time that I only ran. Uh, How old were you when, you when you had that running club? Well, it was just the progression of life, I think. I stopped skiing when I was in the military uh, in, in Finland. Um, it's mandatory for one year. And running was a big part of, of anything there. So it was just a natural thing to keep going running. And then when I moved here in my early 20s, I only ran, and I, I ran marathons actually, I ran uh, five, New York five times, Boston three times, um, and a few other ones, well, also shorter races, so. But I kind of found at that time span that I wasn't as talented running as I was cycling, so. And I think cycling was more interesting to me, so. Right now, aside from cycling, are you doing any other sports? Uh, cross country skiing we still do in the winter time, but not competitively, just as a cross training. Right. And then I still run uh, a little bit, um, and I mean, I alpine ski sometimes. I try to do things and not just cycle. Um, plus, with cycling, I mean, I did a lot road when I was a lot younger. Um, now I'm gravitating more to mountain biking and cyclocross, probably because of my daughter, because that's what she does, and, and it works well together. Uh, but we also, in the winter time, we ride on the snow with fat bikes. Right, right. So like, there's not really any days of the year that you couldn't ride a bike. Did a mountain bike cross, uh, fat bike or road, so uh, there's no such thing as bad weather. <laughs> that's right, <laughs> that's absolutely right. How do you keep passion for cycling after all these years? You say you started riding at such a young age. Well, one thing is, I think, the lifestyle. Like, I don't know any different. Uh, so, that's, like, fashion is, is a word that easily can be mistaken with obsession. So, if you also Which would you actually? <laughs> I tried to toe that line. Uh, <laughs> So we all do. that's like, you have to know that line. And and over the years, like, it changed, obviously. You you grow up and you have different goals and objectives in your life. And sometimes maybe you cross that line and you're a little obsessive about racing and, and riding. Um, so it's really like finding that balance, one. 
and then also living that lifestyle like um, honest and the support system I mean so support system for me like supporting my daughter but also I'm married and the marriage has to be a support system so if everybody's not on the same page it becomes difficult um, and I'm fortunate that this is my job somebody has a full-time job and family and maybe their wife or husband is not into cycling or any sports so there's a number of factors that can kind of affect things um, and it's very easy to say oh I can't go out for a ride today because I have to spend time with the family or I have to go to the mall for shopping. And like you were saying your daughter cycles, your, your wife also, she's a very avid competitive runner as well. So I think that's as a whole helps like but the passion itself is you have to find some every time you go on the bike like that you enjoy and have fun. It's not always racing. I mean, yeah, I like love racing in a competition, but it's also seeing places like I have a cycling camp in Italy, and that's not about racing. Yeah, we watched the Tour of Italy and Giro Italia, and but we just ride also on, on roads that kind of iconic roads for old races and the culture there and. That's something that you would never, never see as a regular tourist. Right. Um, it's a very different view from the bike. Um, racing itself, you meet people all the time, different people. You have basic friends, racing friends that you see every weekend. Uh, so it's also a social part. Um, but I think for everybody who races, it's still the competition that drives them. Um, even the play stop 10 or they win the race there's always a competition and that will make that's what makes you go home and train again and race again in the following weekend so very true when did you start FinCraft? Uh, I believe I started officially in 2006 I broke my collarbone and my scapula and I couldn't really work like a regular job <laughs> <laughs> so that was a good transition uh, I had coached some people before that um, part time, but then that's when I really switched to full time. And if I can tell you about FinCraft, so at that time I was trying to figure out a name um, that wasn't associated with me personally. Like I didn't want to have a company named after me. Um, so my daughter's name is Finley, and I'm from Finland. So that's the fin part, and they used to call me the fin or the flying fin. Um, craft means, or craft is strength or power in many languages, German, Swedish, Dutch. Um, so that's why fin craft. Um, and when I started a company, I didn't want to have just one thing, like a coaching. I wanted to have options. What if that doesn't work out? So maybe FinCraft could be a landscaping company. <laughs> uh, so uh, no, I wasn't thinking about that. But sure. Um, so we logical, coaching is the number logical. one, yeah. right? Coaching is number one. But uh, we also do bike fits. We use the retool system. Um, I do cycling trips to Italy now. I have done many times to Arizona and so like training camps. Um, and then we have the race team, so so the race team is divided in many different groups. Uh, there's a road team for men, there's a women's team, we have a junior team, we have a multi-sport team, which is runners and triathletes, uh, and an off-road team. Some mix together a little bit, some don't, some people don't even know each other. Um, so the reason for dividing them up was to have these tight units and feel like you're part of a team. Um, that's really a good, would say, like besides riding a bike, it's also a passion of mine. Um, helping people, like racing and feeling like they're part of a team and excelling. Right, right. right. Have them achieve their goals. Right. Yeah, that's good. And coaching is the same. I mean, yeah, I started the coaching and I think it had something to do with my results and people knew me from racing and that's how everything evolved. 
but it also got to a certain point that it's not about me anymore. Uh, it's what they achieve. So that's kind of like the advertisement for the, for the coaching. So if I coach somebody and they win a national championship or a world championship, uh, they did the work. I guided them or helped them. Uh, and that's very satisfying. Um, so I'm, I'm fortunate I've coached two women that won world championships. Uh, I coached several guys that won and women for uh, uh, U.S. national championships. So um, you're very humble, but what what what, what did you want recently? <laughs> uh, most recently, I wanted to finish national championship on a mountain bike. Fantastic! What was that? That was in this this summer. Excellent. Uh, in uh, July, I think. What's the jersey? Because we have your jersey hanging in our office as well, with the American flag on it. So that's the U.S. Uh, national championship in mountain bikes. Fantastic. So I won the road twice, cyclocross once, uh, mountain bike twice, and then I placed in the world championship, um, third in cyclocross, and most recently fourth in the mountain bike race in Canada. So, but uh, yeah, humble is is really what you should be. It doesn't really change your life. Sure. Uh, winning things, uh, especially on the masters level. If you're a junior and you're an aspiring pro, obviously that has a lot of weight to it. Uh, but I think still humble goes a lot long further than, than bragging about things. And we always used to tell, like, let the legs talk. There's nothing you need to say, right? <laughs> right, right. You, you, so your wife is, is um, she's also an athlete, as now is your daughter. Does it make it easier to balance your life, work, and family time because of that? Yes or no. <laughs> uh, my wife is a runner. She started later in life, like she actually started running when she met me. Um, and she's pretty talented. Uh, she's not at elite level, but she's close for her age. She just turned 50. Um, and she's placing fairly high now in races around here. And she's actually doing uh, cross country national championship on Saturday. What distances does she traditionally competed? Well, she was with running like you do a 5K and then the next thing you want to do a marathon, right? Right. <laughs> if you do a sprint triathlon, <laughs> you, you have Ironman. to do an Ironman. So she was really into to marathons and really wanted to do a, a, a good time. And she has done, I think, 25 or 26 marathons. Oh. Um, but I always tell her, focus on speed and don't run marathons all the time. And, she did take a little break, and she has actually improved a lot in speed now. Um, so she does pretty much every distance, and she even ran on the track a little bit. Um, she's done an indoor event. She has done some local track events. Oh, good. Um, she loves running. Like she has, that's her passion. She doesn't want to ride a bike. I've seen some of that passion with tears. <laughs> that's her thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, always no. crying. Sure. <laughs> that's, uh, Tears of joy. That's a trademark for her when she finishes a race. Yep. <laughs> so, my daughter, um, she's 13 now. So she's been with me to races all her life because, one, my wife is a nurse and she works odd hours and sometimes weekends. So I always had to bring my daughter. Uh, sometimes it was difficult. You had the babysitters and sometimes somebody had to watch her in the races. Fantastic idea for your team that you put together, though. You have a wife who's a nurse who can treat you after you get injured. <laughs> then you have a daughter who could, who could use the power washer for your cyclocross racing and exchange bikes. It's fantastic. Very strategic. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> so when you set that team. up, sport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my daughter was exposed to cycling because I didn't, that's what I was doing. Um, and I asked her many times, do you want to try? To race throughout the years, and we bought her a cyclocross bike, and she had other bikes, small bikes, and she wasn't very interested. Um, like she always said, no, I don't want to try. And there was always some excuse. She did run, and she definitely had some athletic talent, or, or quite a bit. Uh, I always thought swimming was she was really good. Uh, she was naturally uh, the technique. She never really worked on it, but she swam really well. Um, then one day, 
we were at the pretty big race in Boston uh, by Gloucester, and I had finished the first day of the pro race, and I, I said to my daughter, let's do the course and see if we can do it. We had our bike with us, and she didn't really have any cycling clothes or anything. And a couple of other girls, a little older than her, but close to age, came with us, and we rode the whole course, and she had no problem, and she did the whole thing. As soon as we finished, she said, can I race tomorrow? So just with, I think like with kids in general, if they see other kids doing it and, and they able to do the same, that's really what sparks the, the interest or the, and she has raced every single weekend almost since then. Wow. Um, so yeah, I did the exposure, but it wasn't really because of me that she took interest to it. And now she's following all the pros and she knows more about cycling than I do. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about injuries you've dealt with from surgeries. You mentioned uh, collarbone and scapula. What else? So, obviously cycling is a dangerous sport. Sure. There's no doubt for that. Uh, and the faster you go, the less margin for error there are. Um, the more competitive race is that you're closer to each other. Each other, it's obviously higher risk. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's not, if you're gonna crash, it's a matter of when. Um, I think everybody who races crash, some crash more than others. But if you back up a little bit, and, okay, we can take my daughter as an example. I don't really train her that much for fitness and endurance yet. It's more about skills and able to handle the bike and to control everything and being relaxed and it's like skiing. If you learn how to ski when you're a kid, you're gonna be like alpine skiing, you're gonna be much more relaxed and more skilled when you're older. Swimming is the same thing. Yeah, swimming sports. too, that's my biggest issue. I could swim okay as a child, but when I tried to learn as an adult, I was tightening everything up the entire time and I was getting I was being um, I had a coach. Uh, Lisa Swain, she's actually a pretty good uh, an athlete herself and Lisa was coaching me, and I'm in the pool, and across the pool, we were at the Ridgewood YMCA, there's about 30, like, four-year-olds, not able to swim at all, jumping in the water, completely relaxed, I'm like, these kids are gonna drown, just flopping in the water, and literally getting across the entire pool without any effort, getting out of the pool, jumping back in, and I'm there just tightening everything up. Yeah, absolutely, gotta relax. I mean, that's really, so, teaching, kids like skills and different sports and not just the same thing and will make it safer later. So it's basically risk management. So I used to coach a, a NICA team for a couple of years, which is fairly new here in New Jersey. It's a National Interscholastic Cycling Association. It's a nationwide and each state has their own uh, league. They do five races. And that's really to get kids on bikes. And, and we had to go through pretty rigorous risk management and training and first aid and CPR and all sorts of things. It was basically like being a teacher. Um, none of, I mean, there's, the reason why I did it was because of my daughter, because she wanted to do it and she was too young at the time. You have to be in sixth grade. So, I did the first year and she would come to the practices and and most of the practices were about skills. It wasn't about riding long distance or anything. The next year she raced with them and then like she was probably a little too advanced for that and the program. Ninety nine percent of the kids is perfect. It's way very good for them to get the bikes and and it's uh, they see other kids doing the same thing and they're all the same age. It's uh, sixth grade to twelfth grade, um, but risk management is a huge in that league. Like the courses are set up, um, the, the races are a certain way, um, just to keep the kids safe, and not really about the competitiveness. It's more about having fun, and, uh, so that's really like the fundamentals for any sport. Really, um, a lot of people jump ahead and don't then miss out on that part. So having those skills, I mean, 
my daughter broke her arm a couple months months ago, but <laughs> um, <laughs> so that shows you that you can still break things. Sure. Um, Can't defy gravity. So injuries are not some that you could avoid, but you can actually try to be a little safer. Right. Um, so I broke my back in 2011 in a pretty hard crash in a mountain bike. So I was in the hospital for a month. And now I heard you fell off a cliff. Yeah, more or less. It was on a ski mountain. So the difference between falling <laughs> off your bike and falling off a cliff. <laughs> without a parachute. Right. Yeah. Of course. So yeah, I fractured most of my vertebrae, and I had a burst fraction L1. So I had a pretty major surgery, and uh, my lower back is fused. So uh, I was four months in a neck brace, and then. After that, that was the first time I thought maybe I could still get back on a bike. <laughs> and that's funny because two, two of our uh, two podcasts previous, we had Shane on board. And Shane, same thing. It's like, uh, I think I was down, uh, down shore and I got a text message from Shane with him in a cervical thoracic immobilizing brace. He's like, yeah, broke my neck in a bike race. Yeah. So when you, when you injured your back, and you, you started feeling better. Was that was at any point did you think I'm just gonna stop racing? Well, I didn't think about racing or riding at all while I was recovering. Like I basically switched off my brain um, as soon as this happened. Like yeah, for the first couple of days, like you said, oh, I'm not gonna be able to do any more anything, and I was this close to being paralyzed. So, but then like I focused on it each day to get better. Like that was my only focus. Like I couldn't even walk from the couch to the fridge when I got home after the hospital. Like part of it was the broken back, but I also had a staph infection, so that one was killing me. Um, then I started working to the end of the driveway. I couldn't walk, walk to school with my daughter yet. Uh, so it was like a process. But my only goal while I was down was to be able to do things with my daughter. So ski, bike, run, anything. I wasn't really concerned about racing or that never really crossed my mind. Then I got my next brace off and that was the first time I thought like maybe I could try to ride a bike. So I went out for a ride on a mountain bike and it basically felt like I'd never ridden a bike before. Wow. And I lost a lot of muscle mass and I was pretty weak. <laughs> that was really the thing. So. But I kept riding and 30 minutes, 45 minutes a day and not really training or anything, just riding. And this happened in August and I think I got my neck brace off like the end of December, so about this time. And in February I already had a cycling camp in uh, Arizona and I rode three weeks with them, about 1,500 miles in severe pain. I didn't really plan on riding. I actually brought a scooter with me, just in case I couldn't ride. But uh, I was able to ride. Um, and when I came back, obviously my fitness was better, and the pain in my neck and shoulders kind of went away. Uh, and then I had the Italy camp, which was another 600 miles in nine days. And there was the first time I felt okay. Like I felt pretty good. And then we came back. From Italy and uh, in June, so basically ten months later, I decided I'm gonna try to race. The first race was a little scary, okay. uh, being close to each other, but I felt fine riding. Uh, there was no real. I was much lighter actually, <laughs> so climbing was easier. Uh, and then, almost exactly one year after um, the crash, I won a pretty big stage race in Vermont. Um, so I think for me to get back to the racing and back to training fairly quickly kind of aided the recovery. And some people probably would never gone back to racing or and maybe they would not recover fully. Um, I don't have any side effects today. I wish I had a little less flexibility, but do you feel that you're at the same level you were prior to your, to your injury? Uh, it's hard to tell because 
I mean, win now, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I still win races. So um, it's eight years now, so I was, I'm also eight years older. But um, I think I was, I got pretty close to maybe the power was slightly less because I lost, I did lose some muscle mass, uh, and I had severe nerve damage in my legs. One leg felt different from the other. Still do a little bit. Um, so I'm sure it affected somewhat, but um, I think the biggest thing was the willpower to get back. And like now I can stop racing if I want to. Like I proved it to myself. I got back, and I don't really have anything else to prove. So that's good. So we are making an announcement today that Roger will no longer be racing. <laughs> <laughs> Official retirement. One more year. One, one more race this year. Official retirement right here. Wait, it, Roger, did you do the same event that Shane did, the hardest day? What, what's it, What's that event called? Uh, no, I didn't do it this year. Not this year? No. Okay. Uh, that was a gravel rider, I think. I think it was like 10,000 feet of climbing. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. And Pennsylvania. I don't want Andres to do it. does it. Yeah. I don't he does, want to do it over Mars. Yeah. Andres is one. Oh, that was hell of 100. Hell, yeah. Uh, I think, or something like that. Hilly's day ever? Something, something like that. It's got an odd name to it. Hillier than thou? Hillier than thou, that's it. That's it, that's it. Roger, how is uh, FinCraft Juniors developing? Well, so with the Juniors, like when I first started the team, I think in 2007 or 8, it was mostly masters and adults. We had no juniors. Um, but the goal was to kind of establish the team and have the structure of the team and brand the team with everything and get all the connections so we eventually could support a junior team. Originally I had thought about a under 23 team because here in the US there's not many of those and but then once my daughter got into cycling and stuff so it naturally became like a new junior team. So. The idea was for all the other masters and adults and parents and to support this team. So I couldn't do it myself. So I mean, I do somewhat, but they still need parents um, and other riders to help. So that was the structure for the. And we're now getting to that point that we can have an elite junior team, which is it's been over ten years. So. Um, the biggest, well, first of all, like anything I do, like the coaching, the cycling camps, the I always, like I said, I don't want, I don't want FinCraft to be associated to my name, but I want it to be associated to my standards or I don't know what you would call it, like level of things. So like I don't coach too many recre recreational cyclists. Uh, our team is not about recreational cycling, it's trying to be at the highest level of racing. Right, you want to produce results. Right, so right. that's how I always was and I, when I mentioned about where I grew up, which was super competitive, um, that's really who I am. Like that's, and So the junior team is the same, like it's not the NICA team that's trying to get kids on bikes, it's it's the team for elite level juniors that can win nationals or they can eventually become pros, uh, which is easier said than done. But uh, so that's the goal with the junior team, and it's fairly small. We only had three juniors before, but one junior actually moved on to another team, and I'm about to ask another junior. So it's a small team for a number of reasons. One is financial reasons, and then also um, it's a tight team. Like it, they know each other well, and they're, they're able to ride with each other. If you have a bigger team that's all different levels and different skills, and it's hard to sure. to run as a team. So, um, so I think we're getting there. Like it's not the biggest or best team yet, but you're heading the right direction. Good, fantastic. Very good. Well, Roger, thanks for thanks for coming on this podcast, doing this with us. Appreciate it. Doc, anything in closing? No, it's fantastic. Enjoy it. Roger, anything else? No, um, I think 
like what you are guys doing here is is a great thing in addition to what everybody else does on their own I have so many clients that come here for various things um, that have problems and this is a great guidance that you do and fixing them a little bit here and there and um, and then it's like opening their minds to other things like that's the biggest problem with athletes of their two tunnel vision on, on what they do and they don't really want to do anything else that would help them so so like strength and conditioning is one thing all this functional strength and just muscle maintenance and and so many different things like diet and just like like you said lifestyle but um, you can improve not just an athlete but as a person as, as a human, human being, right? human being by paying attention a little bit more to, to everything around you, what's available. So, I mean, this, this is what uh, Dr. Dan and you're doing here is, is a tremendous help for athletes if oh, they take advantage of so. Thank you very much. Very okay. kind of you. If you like, if you'd like, you can subscribe to our podcast on YouTube and iTunes, and please share with your friends or anyone who may be interested in our content. Until next time, Train your brain, train your body.